So I'm giving this presentation today on behalf of Emily Kachurgis, who is our BLM Headquarters AIM coordinator. We're going to switch a little bit and talk about federal lands. Um, so I'll start this presentation by giving a brief overview of some of the reasons why the BLM needs to do regional and national reporting. And then we'll look at a couple examples of national and regional reporting that we've been working on. I'll show you some of the results from our most recent rangeland resource assessment and then show an example of regional reporting for resource management plan effectiveness by looking at the Greater Sage Grouse five year implementation monitoring report for the 2015 plan amendments. Finally, I'll conclude and discuss some of the next steps for BLM monitoring reports. So there are quite a few reasons why the BLM needs to be able to do monitoring and reporting and at a variety of scales. The big picture need for monitoring and reporting was established as law in the Federal Land Policy and Management Act or FLIPMA. Through FLIPMA, the BLM is required to maintain an inventory of public lands. This inventory can and should be scaled up and down to meet the needs of policy and regulation and to guide management at all levels, from the very local individual treatment level to the regional and national levels. FLIPMA also defined the BLM's mission as one of multiple use and sustained yield. Our mission is to sustain the health, diversity, and productivity of America's public rangelands for the use and enjoyment of present and future generations. As you can imagine, this can mean a lot of resource conflicts and pressure. National reporting can and needs to do a lot. Some of the things we can do with multi-scale data sets are to provide a current inventory of natural resource conditions on uplands, streams, rivers, and wetlands, understand ecological trends and changes over time, link vegetation to potential drivers, including natural disturbances and our own land management activities. We can also use the data to provide the basis for funding allocations, policy decisions, adaptive management actions, budget development for different program areas, and for development of large scale planning documents, such as land use plans and large scale EISs. Additionally, we can use the data to fulfill policy mandates and the BLM mission and to importantly communicate with the public, stakeholders, partners, and with Congress. So like the BLM, the Forest Service is required to do national inventories of public lands as part of their requirements under the Renewable Resources Planning Act of 1974. In 2010, as part of these requirements, they released a synoptic review of US rangelands. This was a snapshot review of current conditions and trends of rangelands across ownership boundaries. Unfortunately, in 2010, the BLM really didn't have the data to be able to contribute extensively to this report. Because of this, one of the main takeaways from the report was the need for consolidation of efforts among land management agencies to improve characterizations of rangeland health. The BLM took the challenge. And in the last decade, we have established a monitoring program that enables us to be able to do national reporting. I'll be showing you some of our most recent national reporting results in just a minute. And because it continues, unfortunately, to be true, I do want to mention that one of the other main findings in the 2010 report was that although rangelands were relatively healthy, the biggest contributors to decreased rangeland health were factors associated with biotic integrity, particularly increases in non-native invasive species. So before we dig into our reports, I want to give an overview of our framework. One of the things we did to really answer the challenge of creating these BLM data sets was to develop and embrace the assessment, inventory, and monitoring AIM strategy as part of the national framework that would help us meet our goals. The AIM principles are the foundation for the Landscape Monitoring Framework, LMF, which is the national component of the AIM program and are used for the national reports we'll be discussing. There are five main components of the framework. Structured implementation, which really helps guide development of monitoring programs. Standardized field measurements that allow us to compare information collected in different places and over time, which is critical to reporting on large scales. Appropriate sample designs, which allow us to roll information up to report out a lot across large areas and even across entire populations. Data management and stewardship, which, well, as you can imagine, we just wouldn't be able to do this without electronic data capture and management. And finally, integration with remote sensing, which helps us see patterns and get a bird's eye view of what is happening on the landscape. OK, 
Okay. Since the 2010 RPA, the BLM has come a long way, and we now have several local and national AIM data sets for uplands, wetlands, rivers, and streams. At the national level, we have the LMF for terrestrial locations and the BLM Western Rivers and Streams Assessment, WORSA, for loadic areas. The LMF points are collected using standard methods that mirror the NRCS NRI program points that we've been seeing. In the next couple of slides, I'll show some of the conclusions from the most recent rangeland resource assessment, which is planned to be released this year. So hopefully in 2021. It builds on the 2011 rangeland resource assessment. The BLM section was jointly written by the USDA, ARS, and BLM, and uses LMF data collected on BLM managed lands. Because LMF uses standardized monitoring methods that mirror the NRI program, it means that these data are consistent and we can more easily assess rangelands across borders. This report also uses some of the remote sensing products which have been developed using LMF and AIM points and some of the management action data sets that have been developed such as USGS's land treatment digital library and the BLM's vegetation management action portal among others. There are lots of new opportunities and needs for national AIM data sets like LMF. There is a big need for products like the RPA and other national and regional reports such as the sage grouse reports. What is that the simultaneous development of management action data sets with these national AIM data sets means that we can really synergize to be able to begin to interpret what is happening on the landscape and hopefully tell more of the story of Western US rangelands. So now let's look at some of the results from the 2011 to 2018 RPA. The indicators in the RPA are summarized at the BLM national scale and then estimated by ecoregions. Although I'll focus on the westwide results today, the report is broken down by ecoregions. For the indicators I present, I will also briefly show and summarize some of the general ecoregional estimates, which although we don't have time to dig into them today, are provided in the report. Since we do have some expectation that the indicators will show different patterns in different areas, having the results broken down by ecoregion may help users to better contextualize the patterns they might be seeing in their local areas. In the RPA, one of the indicators we looked at was bare ground. We found that between 2011 and 2018, bare ground remained stable or decreased on BLM rangelands. Predictably, we saw higher bare ground in the warmer ecoregions. So we're not gonna get into depth on any of these today, but here's a quick breakdown of bare ground results by ecoregion. We can see that overall, bare ground was highest in the warmer and drier ecoregions, in the, including the warm deserts, central basin and range, eastern cold deserts, and the south central semi-arid prairies. So good news, right? Well, although we saw bare ground decrease on BLM managed rangelands, this wasn't always good news because a lot of the time where bare ground decreased, we saw increases in non-native invasive species. Non-native invasive species were present on over 50% of BLM managed rangelands, which was an increase of almost 15% from 2011 to 2018. In nearly all ecoregions, except the south central semi-arid prairies, non-native invasive species held steady or increased. Here we can see that the northern cold deserts, central basin and range, and Mediterranean California ecoregions are most affected by non-native invasive species, with non-native species increasing in both presence and cover across these ecoregions. In these ecoregions, non-native invasive species are herbaceous and tend pre to predominantly be annual grasses and forbs. Unfortunately, wildfire continues to increase for a variety of reasons. As you know, invasive species, particularly annual grasses, can act as a driver of and a consequence of fire. As you can see in this figure, between 2011 and 2018, over 21 million acres of BLM managed land is burned. By looking at the vegetation before and after wildfires, we can begin to understand more about the changes caused by wildfire and could potentially begin to more accurately predict which areas are at greatest risk. 
This data can also be combined with treatment effectiveness monitoring to better understand where we can pri prioritize allocations of scarce resources to get the most success. So really quickly, before we move on to the regional sage grouse report, I do wanna give a recap of the RPA. Overall, we saw some good news. Many indicators of rangeland health appear to be stable or improving on BLM rangelands westwide from 2011 to 2018. Unfortunately though, invasive plants continue to be a threat to rangeland health and appear to be increasing across most eco regions, which I think we've seen in the previous presentations. And of course, wildfire, which burned 2.6 million acres annually on average between 2011 and 2018 continues to increase and likely interacts with plant invasions. Excitingly though, we do see that standardized monitoring really helps us speed our learning about the effectiveness of vegetation treatments and other management activities so we can better understand where and how we can begin to address these issues. What? Another important reporting product we use the LMF data for is regional reporting. Regional reports help step down reporting from the national scale to be more useful at the district and field office. Regional reporting for land use plan effectiveness is not only required, but it helps provide a link between national reports and management actions. So the Greater Sage Grouse five-year implementation monitoring report carries out the promise made in the Greater Sage Grouse plan. The Greater Sage Grouse monitoring framework, which you can see in the image here, is an appendix that outlines the methods to <laughs> monitor habitats webinar. and evaluate the implementation and effectiveness of the BLM's national planning strategy. The report covered 11 Western states and reassessed the indicators from the same LMF points that were used in the RPA to evaluate greater sage grass habitat availability and condition. The report also looked at several other important factors to sage grass health, including habitat degradation, intensity of development in habitat, estimates of sage grouse populations, and the BLM's contribution to sage grouse loss and disturbance in the last five years. We do anticipate that this report will be released this year. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the results were really similar to those seen in the RPA. Similar to the RPA, the sage grouse monitoring report found that invasive plants, especially invasive annual grasses, are a threat to habitat condition and appear to be increasing within habitats across the greater sage grouse range. So one of the questions we asked in the report was, what is the trend and condition of the indicators describing sagebrush characteristics that are important to sage grouse? The report includes several indicators, but because we saw good news in this indicator and we can always use good news, I will highlight some of the results for perennial grass and forb cover in the next slide. So to get oriented, this map on the left side shows where the indicator data was collected. All the points occur on BLM managed rangelands. The green points are those that occur in sage grouse habitat and the orange points are other BLM rangelands. Moving over to the graph on the Y axis is time starting with 2013 and ending in 2018. The Y axis is the percent perennial grass and forb cover on BLM administered rangelands. The upper row of dots, the circles, show the perennial grasses and forbs in the sage grouse habitat and the triangles, the lower row of dots, shows the percent cover on the rest of the BLM managed lands. As you can see, overall the percent cover of perennial grasses and forbs in sage grouse habitat on BLM managed rangelands appears to be increasing. I'm not going to get into them here, but there are several state level appendices where they walk through many of the same questions as were asked in the national report at the state level. So each of the states also did an additional breakdown analysis to break down the results by habitat type based on the habitat objectives tables that were seen in their state level land use plan amendments. Here I have the benchmark analysis for Colorado. One of the important differences between these state breakdowns and the earlier national results is that they not only use the LMF data, but all the AIM data they had available in the state. They then did counts of which plots were meeting or not meeting the desired benchmark condition for each of the indicators. So an important thing to know 
is that because these are counts, they may not reflect the actual proportion of land meeting or not meeting like the earlier figures that we talked about. The main takeaway from this particular table is that in Colorado, for nesting and early brood rearing and for late brood rearing and summer habitat, a good majority of the plots are meeting the benchmarks set for perennial grass and perennial grass and forb cover. This won't be true of all indicators and it won't be true in all of the states. Okay, so what we can see from all of this is that we can really combine AIM data with remote sensing data and land use data to get a much more complete picture of what is happening on the landscape and with sage grass habitat. AIM is a really important and useful tool in all of this and having multi-scale data sets can help with the regional land use plan effectiveness reports and for other regional scale reporting needs. And when they're available, it's really important to look at what's happening both nationally and regionally because there can be some really important and interesting regional nuances. So where are we now? We are able to use aim points to accomplish the national reporting goals set by FLIPMA, PRIA, and the OMB. We're continuing to integrate national reporting with business practices, including developing regular reports, supporting large-scale NEPA and planning efforts, and we're using these data to inform the budget process and to target planning efforts. So what happens next? I'll talk about some of the things we have identified, but what we really have is an opportunity to learn and grow. And we wanna hear from people like you about what would be useful to, to have and for us to develop. So one of the big things we really want to do is focus on identifying what kind of reports are useful to people and then really tying the data from all the lands together to create reports that cross boundaries and help us understand what's happening across the landscape. And we're in a really good place to do this. We have standardized monitoring techniques across these boundaries so we can really talk about what is happening in a cohesive way. We would also like to focus on how to develop causal analyses so that we can better understand why changes are happening and whether, where, and how we can implement management changes to improve rangeland health. We also would like to continue to link these rangeland health indicators that we collect using AIM and NRI data to the benefits or services that rangelands provide to people. And we'd also like to continue to integrate rangeland health with streams, rivers, and wetlands, which is possible since we have Bursa and Lodic and Lentic AIM data programs that we're continuing to grow and develop. So all of this data is a crucial piece of the management puzzle, balancing competing and often conflicting resource uses and needs. The data supports the BLM, rangeland users, partners, and the public. You all are a key part of our efforts. If you have any national or regional reporting needs that could benefit from AIM data analysis, please reach out to Emily Kachurgis. Her email is below, ekachurgis at blm.gov. And of course, this all takes place in the context of a changing climate. It's crucial that we understand where our rangelands were, are, and will be as part of the bigger picture of understanding how to manage rangelands in a changing world. And I'd just like to conclude by giving a huge thank you to everyone who has supported all of this. This wouldn't be possible without the community we have to support the data collection and the organization. In particular, Emily Kachurgis and the report writers listed here who really poured all of these reports together. Thank you.